Hi everyone, Limor is here and uh, welcome to my new podcast from a woman to a leader where we help women uh, scale up their careers and I'm so happy to have with me today Ashley McCray Ford who I had a great pleasure to meet in Tel Aviv like a few weeks ago and Ashley is an incredible leader and an incredible woman and she's the co-founder and CEO of Of choose. Hi, Ashley. How are you? Hi, Lamore. I'm doing lovely. Thank you for having me on your podcast. Thank you so much. And uh, I want to tell you all that thanks to Ashley, she's the one I mean, I've been thinking about uh, creating a podcast for a while. I had a name, the theme, even episode ideas, and I was procrastinating so long until I met Ashley and And she said, let's do it. So thank you so much, Ashley. Thank you for giving me the push I needed. You are so welcome. And thank you, podcasters who are listening out there. Let me just spend a few seconds bragging yeah. more. So I was in Israel for a trip for school and I was connected with Limor for, I was looking for phenomenal coaches, phenomenal women entrepreneurs and a friend of mine, Julia Austin, but you have to meet this woman. So not only did she pick me up, she took me to this phenomenal pizza spot and we had the best wine and we were just discussing our different passions and our synergies. And she talked about this podcast. And in my mind, I'm like, why has this not existed? But from the conversation, the dialogue we just casually had, this felt like something you were always destined to do. So I am so honored to be able to be a part of it. And I can't wait to see how it continues to grow and prosper. Thank you so much, Ashley. It warms my heart. Thank you. And today we are going to talk about the broken rung. Yes. Which is a new term for me. So why don't you just uh, give us a little bit of background, Ashley. What is the broken rung and why is it even... important for us to talk about it. Yes, I think the broken wrong is a truly very important topic as we talk about careers, women, and especially women of color within the workplace. So we spend a lot of time talking about the glass ceiling, which is saying how much additional effort that women need to put into in order to like push through that glass ceiling and change the numbers of leadership in top C-suite positions. Well, After doing more research, the McKinsey Report for Women in the Workplace uncovered this phenomenon called the broken wrong. So when I'm describing a broken wrong, think of the corporate ladder. Each of those different stepping stones of a ladder is a wrong. So if they, when they zoomed into the corporate ladder wrong, they saw that there was a big disconnect at that first wrong, making a jump from individual contributor, entry-level role to their first manager position. Specifically, women and people of color are less likely to be promoted to that first level of management than their male peers. And if we think of just the power of volume and numbers, if you're having less women and people of color promoted from individual contributors to manager, then that continues this ripple effect of less promotions from management to director, from director to VP, from VP to C-suite. And it creates this cascading effect that we see that causes this need of pushing through the glass ceiling. But if you really want to understand how do you patch up this pipeline issue, we have to zoom all the way out and start at the beginning of the corporate ladder at that broken rung. And that is where I focus a lot of my energy and my attention because I'm an engineer by degree. I'm all about pragmatic solutions. I'm all about a root cause. And when I understood what the, the, the broken wrong was, then I kind of dedicated my life's work to how do we fix it. Wow, that's incredible. And I can relate to your engineering mind. And I'm also, you know, as you know, uh, very occupied about supporting women, but I never thought about, you know, obviously transition from IC to a manager is challenging. I know that I've been there. But I haven't thought about it as like the stepping stone that is basically creating the whole problem. So tell oh, me yes. a little bit about you and how it meets you personally. Oh, yes. So a little bit about me. I'm originally from Chicago area. I am the youngest of seven and a chemical engineer by degree. I start there because it explains my personality just a smidge. I started my career in oil and gas and I spent the bulk of my professional experience in CPG. consumer packaged goods as a product development engineer at General Mills. And I love my job being able to create food that really served the world. 
If you anyone listening has ever had a nice Tex-Mex night at home, we have tacos from a yellow box um, called Old El Paso. Those are my products. Thank you for supporting my job. I was able to use my natural inquiries and excitement about solving consumer problems to tangible solutions that came to food. But as I worked in oil and gas and then CPG, later as a Bain and Company consultant, and what consistently always was surprising to me coming from Chicago area, which is a really prominent place for minority talent, was why, and coming from a matriarchy of a large family, why I didn't see as much talent, women talent leading these companies and specifically women of color leading these companies. I, I didn't understand how, when I was in these rooms, I remember my first job out of undergrad, I was the only woman, I was one of two women in my entire building of 400 employees and I was the only person of color. And I was the only person under the age of 40. So this is an oil and gas middle of Michigan. And I had a very positive experience because I had great coworkers, but it was a staggering experience coming from the way that I grew up. And it kind of set the tone for the rest of my corporate America experience of feeling and knowing that I was coming into rooms and was going to be one of few. And for some reason, I just could never wrap my mind around why there was this disconnect between the quantity of talent that I grew up just being around and the quantity of talent I saw in leadership positions. So that kind of planted the seed for me when I was applying to business school of wanting to answer this thesis, wanting to find the data, wanting to understand like where that disconnects came from. So I ended up applying to business school. I chose to attend Harvard Business School in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And I spent three years of my MBA experience digging into this problem. What helped? for my passion in this space was outside of my work at General Mills, I was extremely active in my community. I sat on the National Board of Directors for the National Society of Black Engineers. It is a 30,000 person international organization dedicated to changing the face of STEM and, and exposing as many black and brown students to the, the power of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics as possible. I was also a Girl Scout troop leader so really providing the voice to young women of entrepreneurship, creativity, and just really giving that sense of self as early as possible. And I was even awarded the youngest woman on the top 50 women in business list back in 2019 for my contributions within the company and outside in the community. And all of these things just kind of swirl together into my passion of how am I helping to really provide the voice to the voiceless. And for me, being a very proud corporate America woman, I wanted to really provide more assistance in solving this problem. That's how I discovered this broken rung. And specifically, how do we fix this broken rung? How do I use all these different experiences, all of the mentorship, all of the learning that's been poured into me to pouring it into the next generation? So 10 years from now, we are not talking about the broken rung. It is something of the past. Wow. And this that's is how we got here. That's incredible, uh, Ashley. Thank you. That's an incredible journey and story. Now you're back, you know, uh, from Massachusetts to Chicago. I am. And I'm so happy to be back. It's been 10 years since I've been back in Chicago for a long tenure. And let me tell you, the first thing I had was a great slice of pizza and <laughs> chef's kiss. Oh, there's nothing that beats hometown food. Absolutely. Absolutely. And when we talk about the broken rung, why, why does it happen? I mean, what have you found out? What, what are the causes to this issue in the first place? Oh, there's so many contributing factors. So one of which that was surprising to see, but was reinforced. I've had over 300 interviews at this point with career coaches, executive coaches, executives, women of color, as well as women, and just overall professionals. I've spoken to professors. I've spoken to industry leaders. I've spoken to CEOs of diversity, equity, inclusion, all focusing on this research prompt. And it's been basically three main contributors that have really fed, fed into what causes this broken rock. So one, individually, I mentioned my experience of being one in the room. And that over time of experiencing subtle microaggressions can create the emotional tax. 
So emotional tax is when an individual is dealing with, for instance, from my experience, I started my career in oil and gas. I remember one of my operators, which is a, a manufacturing term, we were joke, joking about power outage and they were saying like, oh, if the power went out, I wouldn't be able to see you. And because I am a black woman. So in, in order to say, because I'm so dark, I wouldn't be able to see you. So how could we fix the issue? And I was 19 when I was working with this individual. I had forgotten that story until I was talking to my sister recently and she brought that up. And I was like, oh, I had even forgotten that that was one of the a conversation I had with a peer in my first corporate America experience, because that's an example of one of those emotional tax situations. When you experience microaggressions so commonly, it just becomes a part of your experience that you may not even take it as such. A bigger piece is the relationships. So your relationship with your manager is the most potent determination on if a person is going to be retained at a company or not. So they always say people don't quit jobs because they, they don't like their jobs. They're more likely to quit their job because they don't have a positive relationship with their manager. So that is just one of the key relationships that feed into the broken wrong, relationship with managers, but also the relationships they have with sponsors and their manager's managers. So women and people of color specifically are less likely than their male peers to have a relationship with their manager and their manager's manager outside of work. So they, they joke about golfing or like, are you going to play golf with them outside of the workplace? And sometimes the, there's different conflicting data on what causes this. You can think of the Me Too movement and how some male professionals have felt more hesitant on how they want to engage in relationships with their female counterparts. But that also just creates the ceiling. This creates this, this divide. If outside of the work, you're building more rapport, you're building a deeper connection beyond the workplace, that's also where deals are discussed. That's also when you're able to showcase more of the personality of why you are great at your job beyond the tactics. And that is more likely to help grease the wheel for when opportunities come about because they understand what are you looking for? What are your passions? Why you're adding value to the company? These key interpersonal relationships that go beyond. Another interesting point in terms of contributing to the broken wrong in terms of interpersonal relationships are how mentorship relationships are different between female counterparts and male counterparts. Specifically, uh, female relationships in terms of mentorship and coaching are more likely to be focused on confidence, how do you help dissuade the imposter syndrome? Whereas their male counterparts to male mentorships are receiving a lot more guidance on tactical things to add value to the company, such as financial acumen, strategic acumen. And these conversations along the line lead to more promotion because it's easier for this mentor and mentors don't necessarily see the difference that they're providing. They, they have female and male peers, but if you are providing different mentorship to them, it's kind of perpetuating this divide. And then finally, the third piece of, so we talked about individual, just the emotional tax and what it takes to be in this workplace. We talked about the interpersonal relationships. And the third piece is the collective action with the firm. So their systematic bias is real. And that's why it's so important. And I commend organizations who are already monitoring this data. So if we zoom out and look at the McKinsey report and that came out in 2019, they had representation in the corporate pipeline by gender and race. Holistically, about 18% of the entry-level roles were women of color, 30% were women, 16% were men of color, and then 35% were white men. Once you move to the manager role, that had shot up 45% were white men, 17%, so just a one point increase for men of color. And then you had 27% were white women, a drop of 3%, and 12% were women of color. So that was already 6% drop, a third of women of color had already moved from management. And they continue adding that data all the way up until you get to C-suite, where less than 4% of the C-suite were women of color, less than 18% were women in general. These statistics, while they are staggering to hear, they at least allow you to measure the problem. And once companies are able to have the accurate data, we disaggregate the data from people of color, black. When you take the difference between a black woman and a black male, you're able to see that, that black women 
Hispanic women are experiencing this double bias of being a woman and being a person of color. So when companies are able to not only have the data, but disaggregate the data to really see the trends they have in their workforce, then they're able to invoke plans, strategies, and actions to change that. So going back to your initial question of what really causes the broken rung, it is a plethora of things. But if I'm listening to this as a corporation of what can I really do tomorrow? I would say one, making sure that you create a sense of belonging, that you have more than just one person who is a person of color in your organization, who is a woman at the table, who because there's, there's power in psychological safety, as we saw in the Google study of what was the two key factors of productivity. Two, in terms of interpersonal relationship, you have to go beyond a standard mentor buddy program. Is if you were going to have a buddy program, is there a consistent structure? So everyone's having the same experience and it's not just set in terms of ambiguity and what is the metrics, what are the success? And then the last part as an organization, how are you measuring this? Because we know things that are not measured do not get managed. And then from an individual perspective, if you are in the workplace as a woman hearing this on your journey to becoming a leader, how are you creating the supportive ecosystem for yourself? If you may be one of you at your workplace, making sure that you have a network of fellow phenomenal women, fellow phenomenal allies outside the workplace that you can share your lived experiences so you don't feel lonely and you don't feel like you have to go through this on your own because you don't. Making sure that you have these relationships, make sure you power map, see where are the missing gaps between your relationship with your managers, your manager's manager, your manager's manager, manager, that you are enough and you are worthy to put time on anyone's calendar and being intentional about that relationship because it, I know it could feel icky to set these relationships up, but it's really who else is going to empower and advocate for you more than yourself. And then finally, as a company perspective, you being able to cover and keep the data of what you're contributing, the value you're adding, and, and making sure you're adding that into every conversation you have. You're documenting that and sending it to your manager before every update. You're documenting that and sending it to your director. And as you are conducting your own data, you're also encouraging your company to do it as well so that all those pieces can come together as we're working to fix this broken rung. Wow, this is incredible. It uh, definitely seems like a topic that is... Top of mind for you. Uh, oh, I'm so impressed okay. by, by the level of knowledge that you have. So Ashley, I mean, I could, uh, as I said, I, I relate so much. And uh, you mentioned, you know, being one in a room. It happened for, for me, you know, more than once that uh, I was the only woman. And uh, you also mentioned the microaggression. I actually didn't think about it then as microaggression. But, you know, all those little things that are planted in your head and eventually, you know, become reality. And uh, I hear from a lot of women that uh, they are afraid of being assertive because they think that they will be seen aggressive. And a lot of times uh, they are considered too emotional, you know, uh, when it's actually, you know, not a bad thing necessarily, actually positive. So definitely a lot of those biases. And uh, mm -hmm. I wanted you to kind of relate to the relationships, especially, you know, with your manager, with the manager, manager and all that. And you mentioned, you know, it's a boys club. We all know that, right? Golfing or what have you. I'm, I've definitely been there, right? Going to baseball and different things I didn't want to do. <laughs> so what, what do you do? What do you do when you are a woman and you're, you know, surrounded by, by men who love different things that you're not, you don't feel comfortable with? What do you do? That's such a great question. I definitely resonate with all of those examples that you provided. And I'm going to throw out data because once again, as an engineer, I love some data that and it's, it's mixed. So what I did during my early careers when I, I wanted to create the culture that I felt comfortable being in as my authentic self, that I actually volunteered to do a lot of different planning. So the social committee, I would plan and really create this inclusive space that made me feel supported and that also rising tides raises all boats made all of my peers male included feel feel supported such as I planned our technical picnic so I was the PL owner of a multiple hundred thousand budget with a team of 10 that were well over my senior and I ensured that I added pieces into this 
annual picnic that hadn't existed previously, you know, to ensure that I left my mark of inclusivity after I pass it on to the next. And on the flip side, this is a very common theme that we've seen for women and minorities that they take on a lot of volunteer and unpaid roles within the workplace, partially trying to increase their brand recognition to increase the likelihood of promotion. And on the other hot, other hand, maybe even trying to create this culture, as I mentioned, that you want to be in the culture that you're living in. And the data is split on whether that is actually helpful. So you're splitting your time and adding value to the company, but you're not necessarily adding value in the revenating generating component of the business. So now that I am in more of the mid to late stage of my career, where I am trying to fit in more so to your question of how do you really show up as yourself? And even if that means some of these events you are not interested in, I think it is in terms of intentionality. I am extremely intentional with building relationships in a way that makes sense and provides energy for me. I love deep conversations. So I have um, coffee chats, walking coffee chats. So I will be sure to set up time with every single one of my teammates. And during that time, that individual time, I get to know who they are. I share more about who I am and I keep notes about the coffee chat. So I'm able to be able to follow up with interesting articles or like podcasts or things that I find that really make sense for them to constantly be keeping like top of mind in their mind. I will attend events in that I'm interested in all the time. I even picked up golf because I genuinely love a good, I'm an athlete um, and my youth and I love soccer or football, depending on who is the, um, who's listening to this podcast. And I recognize that my ability to be great at uh, soccer or football, the older I get, the less likely that is. So I picked up tennis and golf for my own benefit of how can I be active as my career continues to progress. And I ensure that I add that into the conversations. So to your point on if you don't want to do any of these things, how are you able to still build these relationships and rapport? I think what's more imp most important is finding out what do you do enjoy and making sure that that is something that you incorporate into your relationship with them and the team. Second, sometimes you have to eat your, your vegetables or as my old director would mention, hold on one second. My So sometimes you have to swallow the frog first, and that means you may end up going to an event or two that you may not care for once or twice, but I don't think in this world of Brene Brown and vulnerability and authenticity that we're living in, the idea that you have to continuously do that ongoing is, is definitely not in the reality. And I also think what's really helpful is having this conversation with the person who owns the budget. So if your manager is the one in charge of picking the events that you are doing and you guys constantly keep going to a football game. So one way to ensure that you're not putting a woman or any person on your team in this position of having to go to an event that they don't want to consistently is to have an on, um, anonymous survey that goes out before and after soliciting suggestions and asking for feedback of these events. That way you're able to give your team a psychologically safe space to articulate if golfing really isn't their thing or if going to baseball games or going to sporting events for team bonding or even um, alcohol centered events for people who are sober, if those are not things that really make them feel enabled to bond and have the team camaraderie, because at the end of the day, the goal of these events is to bond and help the team become stronger. So if you feel like you have to fake the funk while you're at these events, it's really not serving that purpose. Absolutely. And uh, inclusivity is not just about women and women of color. I mean, I remember that uh, I had a team outing uh, that we did many years ago. Um, and, and we had to take into account that everyone can participate in different activities, uh, no matter how tall they are, how much they weigh. You know, you, you sometimes have to take different things um, into consideration. And yes. it's not just about the gender or the color. A hundred percent. And even keeping in, in mind the timing of these events. So thinking of people who have families versus people who do not have families, if you're constantly having these team bonding experiences after work, when people have to go take care of their children or pick up from daycare, it kind of makes it less inclusive for everyone, as opposed to this is the importance of these surveys. And the reason why I suggest surveys, as opposed to having the conversations directly with the individuals, because sometimes depending on the culture of your team, they may not feel like they are safe to say, hey, I need you to have 
these team building events during work, maybe a lunch hour. Let's have a lunch focused event where we bring in an expert or have a paint and sip or insert XYZ alternatives. So making sure that once again, going back to data, as a manager, what is extremely helpful is having these anonymous surveys so you can get as much data as possible in a way that protects the anonymity of your team, but also provides you the information of how you can really create a culture that's inclusive for all. Absolutely. Any last tips you have for the women themselves of what they can do in order to move from the IC to a manager? Oh my goodness, so many. I would say one, the the I the biggest thing in my mind is the importance of continuously developing in yourself. So finding a coach, as I'm sure if Limor hasn't mentioned herself, she is a phenomenal one. Oh, um, so you. connect after this. And the reason why I say a coach is a coach is someone who is able to be an unbiased outside perspective to ask you questions and push you on previously held misconceptions that can help you understand the rest of this pie. There's always going to be different pieces that can help you on your journey. And the advice I'm giving you that is applicable today may not be as applicable six months from now. And the beauty of a coach is they're able to know all of the details of your journey, as well as their respective insights and expertise to really put you on the journey that makes the most sense for you. So number one, I would say coach. In addition to that, If you, maybe a coach is outside of your warehouse right now, having that supportive ecosystem, so friends, family, the internet, books, podcasts, there's so many out there that sometimes they can even be uh, an overwhelming amount of resources. So making sure that you find what makes the most sense for you. But I would add third is taking the time to introspect and connect with what are your values and what matters most. And that is an easy way to kind of read read through all of those resources and hone in on maybe one to three goals that are most important for you. Whether that is to the earlier question, how can I show up in these spaces as myself, my true authentic self, or how can I say no to events that I do not want to go to? If that is your goal, I support it. And I guarantee you that there are articles and podcasts for it. So there's so much on this journey of making the jump from IC to manager and resources but I think what's most important is you understanding what are your values and motivations for wanting that jump? Is it the title? Is it the, is it the monetary compensation? Is it just the validation of your expertise and understanding what are the motivations behind your want also makes it so much easier to create a plan and a journey that fits you best. So those would be the last three pieces that I would add for you, listener. Thank you so much, Ashley. So much insights. And now I want to get kind of back to you and uh, how people can reach out to you and, and tell us a little bit about Choose. Yes. So if you could not tell by my passion on this topic, I spend a lot of time working with companies on how are they really supporting their, their talent, specifically Why do I care about the talent? Because the talent is the heart and soul of what makes companies work. So being able to not only retain, but support and promote their women in the workplace. And we're, our focus right now are women of color. So Choose, we are a career accelerator for women of color in the workplace. We are focusing on corporate America. I have a deep background there. And I think corporate America has a unique perspective in terms of really pushing the envelope on innovation. And that includes innovation and in how we treat our employees. The rest of the workplace really follows suit in how that works. So if you want to hear more about Choose, you can check out our website. It is Choose, W-O-C, so C-H-O-O-Z, W-O-C.com. If you would like us to come and provide an accelerator for your company, you can reach out to us online at our website. You're also able to email me at hi at choosewc.com or choosewc at gmail.com. We have a, a couple different methods for you to reach out to us because what's most important is we like to stay connected to you, the women who leverage us, our skill set, and the companies who recognize the talent that they have and the reason that they want to encourage and promote these wonderful women into the roles they deserve. So I would love to keep in contact. I'm also on LinkedIn as Ashley McCray Ford. So I'm happy to continue the conversation if this content resonates with you. I am also a coach. So our focus is beyond women of color. So feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn if you want to hear more about coaching possibilities. Wow, thank you so much. So many ways to contact you and uh, so many things that you do. 
which is incredible and so much needed. So much needed, Ashley. Thank you so much for being here today. It's been a real pleasure talking with you today. It has been such a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for sharing your platform with me. And I look forward to the continued conversation. Absolutely.